Hi everyone, this is Professor Paul. Thank you for watching. This is a short presentation on fairy tales, specifically Little Red Riding Hood, uh, to talk a little bit about what fairy tales do in our culture and how, as a particular type of story, they communicate uh, a lot of information and ideas and uh, help shape our uh, minds and culture. So let's look at some early Little Red Riding Hood stories, some very, very early versions of this fairy tale. Um, one early version from the Middle Ages uh, from France is called The Grandmother, and it fe features a character called a bazoo, which is the werewolf. And the bazoo kills the grandma and takes her place. Uh, when the girl arrives, much of this is you know similar to the story we know, the girl arrives, and the wolf tricks her into eating her own grandmother's flesh and blood. This is a very grim, grotesque version of the story, as you can tell, very different from the modern, cleaned-up versions. Um, and after the girl eats her grandmother's flesh and blood, the cat calls her a slut uh, for doing so. And the girl gets into bed naked with the bazoo, but eventually realizes why she, what's going on and escapes by seeing, saying that she needs to use the bathroom. And so by saying she has to go potty, she escapes and gets away from the werewolf. Here's another early version of the Little Red Riding Hood story from Italy and Austria, a uh, version that's found in those folk um, cultures called Little Red Hat. Very similar to what we've seen before. Here, the uh, bad guy, the villain, is an ogre rather than a werewolf. It, again, kills grandmother, takes her place, and tricks the girl once again into eating her grandmother's flesh and drinking her blood. Uh, but this time, the girl, who again also gets into bed naked with the ogre, it's very explicit in this and the, the other version that the girl is naked, but this time, rather than escaping, in this version of the story, the ogre eats the girl, and so she is killed. She loses. The bad guy wins. And here's another version from Poland called Little Red Hood. Um, and again, these are all uh, very old versions. These are all 13th cent 1300s, 1400s, 1500s era uh, of when these folk tales are being told. Um, here we have the explicit mention that grandmother is sick, in addition to the story that we haven't seen before. Uh, the wolf disguises himself here as Led, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, or rather Little Red Hood, to enter the grandmother's house and eats her and takes her place. The wolf jumps out of bed when Little Red Hood arrives and eats her, but she's still alive. And a huntsman who happens to be walking through uh, the neighborhood hears the wolf snoring, goes into the, the home, goes into Grandma's house, sees the wolf snoring, cuts him open, and rescues both Little Red Hood and Grandma, who were both um, just waiting inside the wolf's stomach. And instead, they fill the wolf with stones, and he dies, trying to run away. So the huntsman takes the wolf pelt, Grandma recovers, and Little Red Hood vows never to go off the path when Mother forbids it. So this is the most happy ending, and, and perhaps closest to the modern version that many of you have told. So a couple of just commonalities, some things to point out between them. In both the Little Red Hat and the Grandmother, the girl has a choice of paths. She has a choice of the path of pins and needles or the path of stones and thorns. And there seems to be some sort of folk uh, significance to taking one path over the other, although what exactly that is is unclear. Um, in the Little Red Hat and Little Red Hood versions, a common theme in both of those stories is that the girl leaves the path, even though she's been told to stay on the path, she leaves the path to gather flowers. And in all versions of the story, some common things that happen, the girl speaks with the monster on the road. She meets the monster beforehand, but doesn't know that it's wicked. She's fooled by the monster's appearance. And they all have the familiar, Grandma, what big blank you have, all the better to blank you with. What big eyes you have, all the better to see you with. What big teeth you have, all the better to eat you with. Right. So it has that very famous formula. Now let's get into the classics. Um, these are the versions that you probably know, the sort of Mother Goose and Brothers Grimm versions. These are the versions that were cleaned up a little bit 
um, and then eventually became the basis of the kind of modern Disneyfied versions of fairy tales that you all probably know. So Little Red Riding Hood, uh, the version collected by and written by Charles Perrault in his Tales of Mother Goose from 1697 in France. This is again a cleaned up version of the earlier versions of the tale. Um, we have the idea of the grandmother is sick, the girl takes the scenic route to collect flowers even though she's not supposed to, the wolf pretends to be Little Red Riding Hood in order to enter grandmother's house and then kills the grandmother, the girl gets in bed naked with the wolf, we have again grandma what big blank you have all the better, all the better to blank you with, and in Charles Perrault's version the wolf eats the girl. Now something that Perrault adds, and this is what became very common um, in fairy tales, at least in our modern era, is an explicit moral, an explicit lesson. And this is what Perrault wrote. Children, especially attractive, well-bred young ladies, should never talk to strangers. For if they should do so, they may well provide dinner for a wolf. I say wolf, but there are various kinds of wolves. There are also those who are charming, quiet, polite, unassuming, complacent, and sweet, who pursue young women at home and in the streets. And unfortunately, it is these gentle wolves who are the most dangerous ones of all. So Perot adds a moral that says, I'm not really talking about a girl and a wolf. I'm talking about sex. I'm talking about women protecting themselves from predatory men and women needing to protect themselves. Now notice, even though he's saying this is about women protecting themselves, it's still sort of Little Red Riding Hood's fault, according to the story, because she didn't do what she was supposed to do. Uh, but so we have this moral, this explicitly social uh, lesson being encoded in the stories. Here's the version from the Grimm brothers, Jacob and Wilhelm Grimm, Grimm. and this is from their German uh, tales in 1812, so about a hundred years after Perrault, their version of Little Red Cap. It's nearly identi identical to Perrault's, but it adds the happy ending, it has the rescue by the huntsman, and there's no explicit moral the way Perrault does. The brothers Grimm tend to leave it a little bit more implicit, but the Grimm brothers also include a sequel. Once more, the wolf talks to Little Red Cap on the road. Here, this time though, she's learned her lesson and she runs straight to Grandma's house and they lock the door. So the wolf waits on the roof to pounce on Little Red Cap. The women, being smart, they know how to tempt the wolf. They hold some sausage out and he stretches his neck as he's stretching his neck to smell it. There's a very cartoonish element here. He falls off the roof and into some water and drowns. So Little Red Cap, even though it doesn't include the explicit moral, there is also a certain morality to it. The women learn how to protect themselves. They're still rescued by the huntsmen though, but they learn how to protect themselves and they use the wolf's greed and hunger against him. Now, generating some ideas, thinking about fairy tales, um, what details from the other versions were most familiar to you? What details from, especially the old versions, were familiar with the, the version of Little Red Riding Hood that you've ha heard? And what were the most unfamiliar or surprising? I would imagine probably the violence is the most unfamiliar or surprising characteristic. Um, what common characters appear in the different versions? What are the commonalities? What are the common events that occur in each different version? And what might be meaningful about these features? For example, having Little Red Riding Hood actually eat her grandmother's flesh and blood. What's significant about that? Um, what morals or lessons might be learned from these texts? But also, what value assumptions serve as foundations for those morals? What I mean by that is the moral that Little Red Riding Hood needs to protect herself from the wolf assumes certain values about sexuality and what is proper sexual behavior for men and women. So what are the assumptions that are foundations for the morals that one might get from these stories? And do they remind you of any other fairy tales or stories that you might have read in the past? And if so, why? Some ideas and themes 
from these stories. Um, one big one is cannibalism, right? We see the wolf eating the grandmother, but also the Little Red Riding Hood being tricked into eating her grandmother's flesh and blood. And that cannibalism is a violation, right? That's a violation of the proper order. It's her becoming monstrous, being brought down to the level of the wolf. And that, of course, is contrasted with the idea of innocence or naivete, right? She's a naive girl. She's innocent. She doesn't know about the wolves, the dangers in the world. So she has to be protected from them. We have the idea of choosing the path and choosing the wrong path. What repeatedly happens in most Little Red Riding Hood stories is what? The girl goes off the path even though she's been told not to. And there's a very clear moral in that. And of course, the repeated motif of dangerous monsters and strangers. Account encountering something that is strange, that is different, that you don't know, and that is dangerous to you. So beware of the new, of the different, of the strange, of whom you don't know. Some other ideas. Disregarding instructions from elders and parents, right? Little Red Hood, Little Red Riding Hood repeatedly leaves the path even though she's told not to. She doesn't do what her mother tells, and that is often, in many of these stories, the reason why bad things happen for her, to happen to her. So you can see a logic, a certain ideology being espoused. Don't disobey your parents. Do what your parents tell you. The theme of sexual predators. The wolf is both a monster, but also, as Perot makes clear, a man, a sexual predator, a human male who's looking for pleasure from a woman. The theme of disguise. The wolf disguises himself. The huntsman might disguise himself. Little Red Riding Hood has to disguise herself. So that, and disguise, of course, is about how do you tell the truth? How do you know if someone is truly honest or not? How do you know if someone is trustworthy or not? Themes of appetite. The wolf is greedy. He is hungry. He wants to eat. He wants to consume flesh both in terms of eating the flesh of the grandmother and possibly consuming the sexual flesh of Little Red Riding Hood. And it's that appetite in the Grimm Brothers version that is his downfall. The sausage, they hold out the sausage, so while reaching for it, he drowns. Or they fill his stomach with stones, and that kills him. Again, these are all symbolic of the way one's appetite can be destructive. And finally, the theme of her heroism, particularly masculine heroism. Note that in some of the versions, Little Red Riding Hood is saved, but by a man. So it's a man that is dangerous to her, but also a man that can rescue her. So think about the cultural work of fairy tales. That is, why do we tell fairy tales and what do they do in our society, in our culture? So think about when you were a child, who told fairy tales to you? Did your mother, grandmother, father, older siblings, friends, teachers? At what ages were fairy tales told to you? And what sorts of impressions did those fairy tales make on you? That is, did they scare you? Did they delight you? Did they make you want to be a certain thing? Did they make you afraid of certain things? And what did the storytellers tell you about the stories? Did your mother, for example, ever say, and that's why you should always do what your mother says. And that's why you should never trust a stranger. And that's why. So think about fairy tales as being not just stories, but something that we do to pass on important cultural knowledge, important values, or at least what we think, what are assumed to be important values. Think about the kinds of characters that are common to fairy tales and what defines them. What are the traits that make them who they are? And what kinds of things happen to the characters? What does that tell us about the problems that fairy tales are trying to deal with? In terms of the types of characters, how do we, why do we identify with these different types of characters? What about them makes them interesting to us? What sorts of actions they, do they perform that are good or bad? And what makes the actions good or bad? And who gets rewarded and who gets punished and why 
And with all these things, it's not just about knowing the facts. It's about thinking, what are the values that are being expressed? What are the ideas that are being communicated? What is this telling us about what our culture thinks is worthwhile and who deserves to be rewarded and what deserves to be or who deserves to be punished? In our culture, fairy tales are always a part of our early childhood experience for most people. There's something that we, we experience as children. And we often associate our fairy tales with female storytellers, mothers, grandmothers, teachers. And that's why they're called old wives tales. There's a little bit of a, a, a demeaning um, nature there, the sense that because they're associated with female storytellers, they're a little bit less serious, perhaps. Um, and they're simple. They don't follow the logic of the real world. They are associated with entertainment, but also with stoking our imagination. And they're used most often, at least today, to promulgate, to promote certain moral lessons, certain traditional values about what it means to be a good man or a good woman. And usually the good man is the hero, the good woman is the wife who stays at home. Like Little Red Riding Hood, who should follow what her mother says and wait to be rescued by a strong man. They reinforce and reproduce social norms. They express what we think is natural and they present a fantasy as reality. So this is some of the things that fairy tales do. So think about how they've performed these tasks in your own life, which fairy tales or folk tales might have been used to teach you certain lessons or values and how you reacted to them. Finally, I just want to go over some, some details. There was a scholar many decades ago named Vladimir Prop who did an extensive overview of hundreds, thousands of folk tales throughout European history and tried to come up with a set of basic rules, structures that govern every fairy tale. And he said there are seven character types that we see. Not every fairy tale has them, but there are seven character types that appear in fairy tales. There's the villain or antagonist, which is the evil character who opposes and creates struggles for the hero. There's the dispatcher, the character who informs the hero of the need for the quest and sends them off. So this could often be a, a, the father of a princess. In Little Red Riding Hood, it's usually the mother that dispatches the, our hero, Little Red Riding Hood. And the villain, of course, would be the wolf. There's often a helper, a character who aids the hero in the quest, might give them some gifts or give them directions. There's a princess or prize. Often the hero needs to prove something in order to win the prize. And again, it's often marriage. It's a hero going on quest for a, a, a woman. Not always but often. And usually the imbalance, whatever the hero needs to rectify in order to win the prize is the cause of the villain. There's a donor, the character who tests, trains, or give, gives aid, sometimes magical to the hero. Obi-Wan Kenobi in the original Star Wars is the donor who trains him, or Yoda, they're both donors. They train Luke Skywalker. The hero, of course, our protagonist, the main character who struggles, who is sent out on the mission, who struggles against the villain, who defeats, generally, usually, hopefully, defeats the villain and wins the prize. And sometimes there's a false hero, a foolish figure who takes credit for the hero's actions, tries to marry the princess, a sort of comic hero that needs to also be dispatched before the hero can win. So these are seven character types that we see. Again, not every fairy tale has them. Some might only have two or three of these character types, but these are the seven types that Prop identified as appearing throughout all fairy tales. So you might think about the fairy tales that you've read and see if, or seen, and see how do the characters, can I assign one of these types to each character? And what does that tell me about their function in the story? On this page and the next couple pages, I'm not going to go over all these, but also it's just going to, I'm giving you a list of the 31 narrative functions that Prop said occur. When he did his extensive study, he said there are 31 types of events that happen in fairy tales. Again, 
Not that every fairy tale has all 31 of these. That would make them very, very complicated. But rather that we see fairy tale authors drawing from a handful of similar events, similar types of functions that occur over and over again throughout these tales. And it's a combination of these different narrative functions that we see occurring throughout the stories. So interdiction, which is a forbidding, um, reconnaissance, the villain seeking knowledge, um, complicity, the victim being fooled and helping the villain, right? These are all things that happen. So I'm just going to give you this last list. This is pretty much the last thing, but I'm going to let you look at these different functions. And I encourage you to return to this, maybe take some notes. Um, for those of you who are writers, this is an interesting way to think about how to structure stories. What are the events that you include? Might help your creativity to experiment with just grabbing a few narrative functions and seeing, well, what would happen if I put this in the story, if something like this happened here? So let's just look through these. Here's our first nine. A few more. Numbers 16 through 22, some very standard narrative events here, the struggle, the victory, the return, the pursuit. Again, not every story has them, but these are the types of events that we see throughout fairy tales. A few more. And our last few. So again, you don't need to memorize these functions or anything like that. I just give them to you so you can see just how intense the analysis and how deep analysis of even something as apparently as simple as fairy tales can get. They're very complex. And so there's a lot that we can see about how they're structured in order to tell their stories. Here are some of the external references that I used. If you'd like to get copies of the different versions of the Little Red Riding Hood story, these are links to all of them. The old classic versions plus the Perot and Grimm versions. Also, if you're interested in looking more at Prop's morphology, at his the way he categorizes the different fairy tales. You can click there and that'll give you some excerpts from his work as well. And finally, some dictionary definitions. Dictionary definitions of fairy tale, a fairy tale ending, fairy tale prince, and a fable. These are all related terms that all relate to the, the idea of the fairy tale. Um, and that tell us a little bit, I think they help us understand just how fairy tales have become part of our culture. That we think about fairy tale endings, we want fairy tale weddings, we want a fairy tale prince or princess in our life. So that's the end of this short presentation on fairy tales. I wish you the day you wish yourselves, and I will see you in the next video.